We're very fortunate to have Michael Plant with us, uh, as we often do at this time in a more formal setting, uh, where he will uh, uh, enchant us with his latest uh, thoughts on license faction. Thank you, Michael. Great. Thanks very much. So today I'm going to talk about uh, what well-being is. Well-being, the thing that ultimately is good for us, that makes our lives go well. Um, this is the Wellbeing Research Centre, so it's important for us to have a view on, on uh, what uh, well-being is. Um, so standardly in philosophy, there are three answers to the question, what is well-being? So the first is hedonism, well-being consists in happiness, how good or bad you feel, the, uh, the, the sort of your net hedonic experience, uh, we might call this enjoyment, contentment. Uh, the second answer is desire satisfaction, desire satisfactionism, so well-being consists in getting what you want in the sense that the world goes the way you want it to, the world fits your desires. And the third option is the objective list. And on this view, well-being uh, consists in various goods, classically things like knowledge, friendship, um, possibly in, in addition to things like uh, happiness. So on the objective list, there's a bunch of things which are interesting, um, and on the first two, there's just, just one thing. Um, but in this faker, uh, paper, I'm going to focus on a fourth theory, which I'll call life satisfactionism. It's sometimes called uh, whole, li uh, whole life satisfaction or whole, sat whole life satisfaction theories of well-being, where uh, well-being consists in life satisfaction, which is an overall judgment of uh, how well your life is going. Can you see people looking around me? Um, so... Um, uh, the, f the fourth view has actually had very little written about it in philosophy, which is, um, uh, which is a surprise. Um, so there's been a few people who have, who have uh, mentioned this view, but it sort of fits outside the, cla the classic three-way split, which uh, philosophers tend to use following um, uh, Derek Parfit's um, sort of classification. Um, so there's actually su there's, there's not, a, not very much has been written about it in philosophy. Um, and it might seem odd to talk about a view which people haven't said but uh, it turns out that uh, social scientists, in fact, the broader world, are really enthusiastic about life satisfaction. So uh, burgeoning fields of social science research uh, into subjective well-being, uh, individuals' ratings of how their lives are going, where subjective well-being, this is all familiar, familiar to everyone here, but taken to have three measurable components. So an experiential or hedonic component, your positive or negative feelings, an evaluative or cognitive component, a judgment of how your life is going or some parts of your life, and a purpose component, a sense of meaning or, or worthwhileness. And um, as uh, uh, evidenced by uh, Sid's talk just a moment ago, when people measure life satisfaction in practice, what they're measuring uh, is, for, for the most part, is, um, is life satisfaction. So that's the most common measure of subjective well-being, and life satisfaction is this one of these evaluative measures. The typical formulation being something like, overall, how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? Zero to ten. So, um, as, a, as a philosopher who has the, the pleasure of hanging out with social scientists, it's rather curious that, that life satisfactionism is taken as something like the default view, um, whereas when I talk to my colleagues in, in philosophy, they're just, they're just not familiar with it, um, and it's just outside uh, the, kind of the, the, the normal classification. And this is, I think, interesting, uh, it's odd, and uh, it raises the question of, well, how good a theory is life satisfaction? If people haven't really interrogated it closely, well, let's have a look and let's see if it stands up to scrutiny and if it, in fact, is as plausible a theory as many people take, seem to take it to be. Uh, and so uh, my conclusion is that I think life satisfactionism isn't a very plausible theory of well-being. That's what I'm going to be arguing for today. Um, so to clarify the, the structure of the talk, um, I'm going to talk about. I'm going to look, look at some terminology and motivate life satisfactionism. This uh, this view, um, uh, the central motivation for life satisfactionism is what I'll call subjectivism. The idea that individuals are the authorities on how their lives are going, and therefore the the, the, the well-being constitutes uh, an overall judgment of, of one's life. Um, there are quite there. Are uh, I'm gonna just going to raise two novel objections to life satisfactionism, which I haven't seen in the literature and I think are, are, are quite uh, very challenging, if not devastating, to life satisfactionism. Um, for the, for in the interest of brevity, I'm not going to talk about some other objections people have mentioned, because I think mine are, are, are stronger. Uh, then I'll uh, conclude, and in the epilogue, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, measuring happiness. So there's two caveats before I, uh, I march on. 
So the first is that whether life satisfactionism is the correct theory of well-being is importantly a different question from whether it is useful in practice to, to measure life satisfaction. So before you all get worried that you've been, uh, been wasting your, your, the best years of your life, uh, you, don't need to, you don't need to maybe worry as much as you, as you might be worrying. And to just comment on that, there are a couple of reasons why we might care about asking people how satisfied they are with their lives and why such measures are popular. Um, do you, is that a question? Do you, do you take that? So if, if you have clarificatory questions, ask me now, but otherwise I'm going to talk for half an hour and then ask me substantive questions at the end. Yeah. Okay. Um, and life satisfaction measures are uh, uh, popular for a couple of reasons. First, because they're cheap and it, they're, it's easy to collect data. So if you wanted to survey someone's happiness, for example, through the day reconstruction method, you might have to get them and sit them down and ask them to break their day into a number of episodes and say how good or bad each one was, and that might take them 40 minutes, whereas the life satisfaction questions people can answer in a, you know, a few tens of seconds, if not less. So it's an advantage. Um, the second is that uh, an important feature of life satisfaction questions is that individuals are judging how their own lives are going by their own standards, whatever they are. And there's a few reasons you might be really interested in this property. Um, one is that if we're thinking uh, about, uh, about public policy and we have ideas of, uh, of justice and, and so on, that we should respect people's wishes about what makes their lives go well, even if we think um, they're wrong. So it's important to account for people's own uh, theories of the good life, even if we think they're mistaken. So that's one reason. Uh, the second reason to care about life satisfaction measures is, is, of, is if you think life satisfactionism is true. You really think well-being consists in the, uh, these overall judgments of how your life is going, and therefore it's just you know, the ideal measure. It really is capturing uh, what makes life go well. A third option would be that you don't think life satisfactionism is true, but you think life satisfaction scores are a pretty good proxy for telling us how people's lives are going. Um, and I think something like this is, is the case. So you might be a, a hedonist and think, well, it's quite hard to measure happiness in practice. It's, it's a lot more effortful. But we can just ask them, people how satisfied they are, and that's going to get us lots of the way, and it's going to be much cheaper. So I think life satisfaction is a pretty good measure for happiness, but I don't think it's the ideal uh, measure of happiness. And you might have other views of well-being where you think, okay, life satisfaction is capturing something pretty important, even if it's not you know, the ideal measure of what well-being is. Yeah, so I'm only taking issue with, uh, with two in this talk. Um, and if I'm right about that, then life satisfaction scores won't be the ideal measure of well-being. We should look elsewhere. Um, and whether or not I'm right, life satisfaction scores, just like all kinds of other uh, bits, of, bits of information, health, income, are the sort of things we're going to want to measure and find out about. So uh, whether I'm right or not, we don't need to stop measuring life satisfaction, but we might want to think more carefully about uh, what, what ultimately uh, is, the, is, the, is the information we're interested in for the purposes of making decisions. The second caveat is that I'm, I'm arguing against life satisfactionism, and I'm not arguing for an alternative view. So I put four views on the table, um, and I'm just going to uh, raise some problems with one of them. And if we're making a decision about which view is best overall, really we need to look at the pros and cons of each. So it's a bit like I'm saying, you know, don't go to France, and we're thinking about going to France, Italy, Germany, Spain, and I'm just saying, you know, don't go to France, or here are some reasons you might, want, might, might not want to go to France as much as you thought. But you know, the overall assessment is, is more... Okay is more comparative. Um, and as a motivation for why I'm uh, approaching things this way, so I find hedonism, the view that well-being consists in happiness, uh, pretty plausible. At the end of the day, I think that's, pro that's the most compelling answer. Uh, and therefore, happiness, rather than life satisfaction, is going to be the ideal measure of well-being. It's going to be what well-being really is. Um, but the, the way I'm approaching things this way, uh, rather than just defending hedonism, saying, here are some objections to hedonism. Let me tell you why they're not so bad. I think if I did things that way, um, the response would be from, from uh, inside and outside this room, well, but isn't life satisfaction you know, really where we should be looking? And because that hasn't been so scrutinised in the literature, that's why I want to focus on that and try and address those questions. Um, and yeah, so people are just much more familiar with the pros and cons of, of hedonism, and I think this view hasn't been given uh, so much attention. So that's why I'm doing things in this way. And maybe, uh, maybe next time I can just come here and just straightforwardly defend hedonism, having said some, some uh, maybe unfairly rude things about 
less satisfactionism. But Mike, will we see whether or not the, the criticism you levy against less satisfactionism would the same criticism hold against hedonism? So there'll be different criticisms, um, and so the comparative task here, there's just not time. Um, uh, so what I'll, where, where this talk will be ending is saying, in effect, um, going to France is just a lot, lot worse than you, than you might have thought. Okay, so for those of you who were already thinking, I'm definitely going to Paris, you know, maybe consider going somewhere else. But I'm not going to answer the, the comparative question. It's just that you hinted at hedonism being Paris. Uh, or, or Spain as an alternative, and so it would be interesting to see whether the, ultimately if the argumentation against license sections uh, holds or doesn't hold an argument for, for going up to France with the Spain, i.e. hedonism. Yes, so, so I'm, this is, I'm not completing the full task I'd like to complete, and that's just for reasons of space. I'm, I'm happy to undertake the, the further task at some further stage. Okay, so to uh, understand theories of, of well-being, um, following Roger Crisp, theories of well-being need to have two parts. So the first is a substantive part, so what are the thing or things that make up well-being, what does it consist in, and then explanatory part, so for those things which we think make up well-being, why are those things good for us? So you need, you need two bits. So um, what you might call hedonism proper is the view that is combined substantive hedonism, well-being consists in happiness, um, and explanatory, happiness, uh, explanatory hedonism, so happiness is good for us because of its intrinsic pleasurableness. So that's what is it, and then why do we think that thing matters? So you could, be, you, you could have the view where you say uh, um, well-being consists in happiness, but happiness is what, is what matters because that helps perfect our nature as humans. And then you'd be a, a substantive hedonist, but you'd be a sort of an explanatory perfectionist. And so hedonism proper is going to be the one which has sort of, the, sort of matching answers at both levels. And this is going to be important later because I'm going to suggest that the... Uh, because the, the criticism g I'm going to make of life satisfaction uh, comes from what we think the explanation for caring about life satisfactionism is in the first place. Okay, so uh, what is life satisfactionism? The substantive bit is that well-being consists in an evaluation or a judgment of how one's life is going overall. So something, something in this area, it's the judgment of how your life is going. So that's, the, you know, that's what well-being consists in if you're a life satisfactionist, but why would you care about this. So let's survey some candidate answers. <coughs> so this is, um, I'm just going to read out the, the long quote from, um, uh, from The Origins of Happiness. This is page four, and here's, uh, this is a, a recent um, ex notable and, and authoritative tome on um, happiness, which takes life satisfaction to be the thing which matters. And so here's what the authors say. We prefer life satisfaction as our measure of well-being for a number of reasons. First, it is comprehensive. It refers to the whole of a person's life these days. Second, it is clear to the reader. It involves no process of aggregation by researchers. Third, and most, important, most importantly, uh, it is democratic. It allows individuals to assess their lives on the basis of what they consider to be important to themselves. It does not impose anybody else's view on wh uh, what experiences uh, are valuable. This is particularly important if we want policymakers to use these results. Okay. So, uh, um, uh, the authors of Origins of Happiness think they offer three reasons, but I, I can detect six reasons in what they say, and I'm going to uh, uh, say what the reasons are, and then I'll say why I think only one of them speaks uniquely in favour of life satisfactionism. Okay, so the first is that the measures are comprehensive, they capture some aspect, um, all of some aspect of life, the measures are clear, the reader understands what's going on, um, there's a, what I'm calling anti-pluralism, so researchers don't have to aggregate the relative value of different kinds of goods. So you, you just say, look, life satisfaction is just the one thing we care about, so it's not like we take happiness and we take autonomy and we have to trade off happiness and autonomy. Um, Anti-paternalism, so governments should not impose their views on what well-being is, even if that would increase well-being, so that's a, something, a suggestion I mentioned before. Uh, practicality, so this one I think comes out of the, the text, that governments, you, know, you might think maybe governments will more effectively increase well-being, whatever it is, if, but if they aim at life satisfaction rather than, say, aiming directly at something else. So uh, there's sort of a paradox of happiness flavour to this. If we just try and make people happier, that'll backfire, but if we aim at the, uh, increasing their life satisfaction, that allows them to contain the, the conditions for, uh, for a flourishing life. Um, and then six is subjectivism which is that individuals are the authorities on how their lives are going. 
So um, these are, I think, some of the, the reasons you might put in favour of, of life satisfaction being the ideal measure of well-being. But I think only one of these is really an argument for life satisfaction. So if you wanted a comprehensive measure, you could just have a comprehensive measure of happiness or of health. Um, if you wanted a, a, a clear measure, you could just ask people about their, you know, their height or their income or their education level. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're concerned about researchers aggregating different goods, you just need to have a single good. It doesn't matter what that thing is. Again, it could just be income. Um, if you're an anti-paternalist, this isn't really a, this doesn't say anything about what well-being is. This just says, look, at a matter of uh, justice on the political level, politicians and policymakers shouldn't say what well-being is. So it's not a claim about what well-being is. It's a claim about what government should do. It's, so so anti-paternalism is sort of it doesn't make a claim about what well-being might be. It's consistent with anti-paternalism to say well-being consists in happiness, but we don't think government should make should just make people happy. We think government should uh, people should, should follow what people want for themselves. Uh, the fifth is not a claim about uh, uh, well-being, that's an, uh, about what well-being is. And in fact, I think it's probably uh, the kind of person who's pushing this practicality point would be claiming that, um, so that something other than life satisfaction is what makes up well-being. Because if you just thought life satisfaction was really what well-being is, you wouldn't need to make this concern about practicality. So the only thing which I think is left standing is subjectivism, the idea that individuals are the authorities on how their lives go. Um, you know, they can choose what matters to, uh, to them, from the, from the quote before. So I think it's subjectivism which uh, uh, is, the o is the only of those reasons which gets us to the view that life satisfaction would be the ideal measure of well-being. And I think this... Go on. Okay, you can absolutely argue if you think it doesn't help with the analytical view. So in the, in the, in the fifth point, the rise, mm -hmm. so... And analytical views, governments would more effectively increase well-being, but you start by the fact that we have different definitions of well-being. Yeah. So what do you mean by... Yeah, so, I mean, just to return to the quote, you, um, uh, so they should create the conditions where people are satisfied. So uh, democracy people should not make judgments about what's good for people. They should create the conditions where people are satisfied with their lives. So I think, I mean, I'm not necessarily interested in, in um, doing you know, sort of Andrew Clark and Richard Lay are exegesis and working out what they mean in their text. But I'm just saying that here's this, here's this reason you could say is that uh, w one might think, look, well-being really consists in autonomy and, free, uh, and, um, and knowledge, okay? But I think if we just try and increase autonomy and knowledge directly, we're going we're gonna to screw it up. So what we instead do is we try and increase life satisfaction and that allows people to... Um, uh, and, that, and that's sort of just an instrumental way of getting us to what really matters in terms of well-being, which is autonomy and, and knowledge. So I think the practicality... That's almost not how they see it. They would see autonomy and knowledge as a means to an end, and being, well-being, as operational. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I, so I think, I mean, like I say, I'm not interested in, in exactly what it is they, they mean. But this is an argument you, you could put forward, I think, is sort of in the, sort of in the spirit of it. So you know, that's, another way, that's another way you could think, look, we should life satisfaction because it helps us get to the thing which really matters, which is implicitly not life satisfaction. And just about the six, so I, I will not understand the difference with the hedonism? Uh, we'll come to it. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I just say why, life, why subjectivism gets us to life satisfactionism, and then I'm going to say why subjectivism is a, you know, an idea you might find interesting. Okay, so what we were looking for was a what's the what's going to be the explanatory thing for life satisfactionism, which is going to match with the substantive bit. So this is what I think is probably life satisfactionism proper. So substantive life satisfactionism, well-being consists in evaluating one's life, is going on, how it's going well overall. And then the explanatory bit is in the individuals are the authorities on how their lives are going. So that's why well-being consists in the judgments people make about their lives. So it's the subjectivism which is doing the work and explaining why well-being consists in how satisfied people judge their lives to be going by their own standards. Okay, so why be a subjectivist? Um, I think this is, doesn't require a huge amount of motivation. So we're talking about well-being. We, we're interested in how things can go for people, how, would, how their lives can go well for them. And it's, it's peculiar to think that um, something can be better for me if I don't think it does. Right, that's, it just seems it, it grates a bit to think that. So, to quote uh, Relton, it would be an intolerably alienated conception of someone's good 
to imagine it might fail in any way to engage him. And I'll just give you a couple of cases, so uh, just to kind of try and get your intuitive juices going to why, why you might be, be drawn to subjectivism. So one is the, uh, the starving artist. So imagine there's some person who, uh, uh, who would be happier if they became an accountant, but they're living a life of a, of, you know, a bohemian life as a starving artist. They're living up to their, their values as they see them. They think their life is going, like they're living just the kind of life they want to live, but they're, they're miserable. And you, know, you say, well, you know, Tim, why not become an accountant instead? And they go, no, no, that's, that would be worse for me. I mean, I would be happier, but it would be worse for me. It's not what I want. It's not how I judge my life to be going well. Uh, another example, uh, the sort of what I call the reformed hedonists. So imagine there's some, some uh, you know, venerable elder statesman who's now repentant of all of the carousing he did when a, a university student, and looking back says, I know I was having fun then, I know I was getting what I wanted, but I don't think, I don't think my life was going well for me then, because I don't endorse that version of life. I don't, you know, even though I was having a great time, I think my well-being was low there because I was, uh, I was making mistakes about you know, what's really valuable in life. And uh, subjectivism allows us to um, recast and re-envisage our, our life in this, in this sort of way. So that I take to be, um, you know, it has, some, it has some, some real appeal. <coughs> so there's a, bit, a little bit of... Michael, just to clarify, just if you go back, subjectivism here, especially in these cases, is relevant if you're thinking about evaluative well-being, looking back and evaluating the situation, whereas if you were to look at hedonic well-being, the reconstruction or in the moment measurement. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so if we're looking at, say, the, the reformed hedonists, so the reformed hedonists, you know, by the setup of the case, is that this person's uh, well being, according to the hedonic, the, the is, is, going, is going really well. But, um, but, but this person says, look, okay, I, I, I was happy then, but mm -hmm. my life was going poorly because actually that's, mm -hmm. not, that's not what I think makes life go well. So the idea is exactly that there's a difference between. The hedonic, you know, what the hedonist would think makes life go well, and what the life satisfactionist thinks makes life go well. Yeah. Um, so there's um, th there's a view which seems to uh, I've sort of I've detected in discussion that there, are, um, quite often people will say something like, um, "What I think matters is that people enjoy their lives, and I think life satisfaction is a pretty good measure of of happiness, of how much of how people's lives feel to them." And therefore, life satisfaction is the ideal measure of well-being. I just want to sort of put, put pressure on this as, as, I think, being confused. So to have this kind of view where um, it seems like you'd have to oddly combine two parts of a theory of well-being. So if you think you know, life satisfaction is the ideal measure of well-being, you'd have to hold something like substantive life satisfaction. So that's what well-being consists in, this overall judgment of life. But if you then said, you know, the reason life satisfaction is what matters is because... Um, being satisfied with our lives makes us feel good is just at odds. If it seems like if what matters is making us feel good, you should be interested in um, you should be interested in happiness rather than people's judgments of life. So I just I just note that um, you so I'm you might be wondering what the difference is between life satisfactionism and desire satisfactionism. And life satisfactionism is about states of the mind, and desire satisfactionism is about of the world. So here's a case which splits them. Imagine what I really desire is for there to be cheese on the moon, and there is cheese on the moon, um, because it's what and, but I don't know about it. So on the desire satisfaction theory, uh, uh, my life is going better <coughs> because I, my preferences are being satisfied, the world is going the way I want it to, but on the life satisfaction view, uh, my life is going no better because I don't know about it. So one is about uh, it's about what, you know, how you're judging your life to, go, to be going, other is about what's happening in the world on the basis of, uh, of your desires. Uh, the objective list, it's pretty easy to see how that's not the same thing as life satisfactionism. So, you know, on the objective list, well-being consists in uh, flourishing, all, all these sorts of other things, potentially. There are different formulations of the objective list. Um, and whether these things are good for you uh, doesn't depend upon whether you know you possess them, and it doesn't depend on whether, it, whether, you, think they, uh, whether you think they matter. Um, so just, uh, I think this might, might be helpful, so dis dis a couple of ways of distinguishing theories of well-being. So you have mental state theories of well-being, where well-being depends in some important sense on what's going on inside your mind, your happiness, your desires, beliefs, judgments. 
Um, and then you also have subjectivist versus objectivist theories of well-being. So the subjectivist theory of well-being is one where well-being depends on what the subject judges it to be, and objectivist theories are ones where well-being does not depend upon what it is you think well-being consists of. And so this allows us to, uh, I think, somewhat neatly split these theories. So you have life satisfaction and hedonism. So they're mental state theories. It matters what's going on inside your mind. So life satisfaction and the objective list are you know, non-mental state theories. It's about what's happening in the world. Um, but only life satisfactionism is a subjectivist theory. So the hedonist says, happiness is good for you, whether you think so or not. The desire satisfactionist says, having your desires met is good for you, whether you think so or not. And yeah, the objective list says something similar. Knowledge and, and beauty and friendship are good for you, whether you think so or not. So all the rest of the theories are objectivist. Uh, point of clarification, but the, the, the notion of subjectivism is the, the democratic aspect. Is that you're asking people how they feel, whether it's in the moment, on it, or about it. No, so, so, that, so that's, that's, uh, that's not how I'm thinking of it. Subjectivist is, is I'm using it specifically to refer to theories of, a theory of well-being where individuals uh, determine what makes up their well-being, what makes their life go well. So the kind of hedonism is the interesting case here. So um, uh, is a, a hedonism is, is an objectivist theory of well-being. The hedonist says, um, so take the starving artist. So the hedonist says to the starving artist, you would be happier as an accountant. Your life would go better. I know you don't think so, and you don't endorse the life of the accountant, but all that matters for your life is, uh, is your happiness. So it doesn't matter what you think, you know, it's about what you feel, which that's how, your that's how the value of your life is determined. So although hedonism is a mental state theory, you know, what's going on inside your mind is a key bit, or the key bit, it doesn't matter whether you think happiness is what makes your life go well. Yeah, but in that example, you're equating, you're equating uh, sort of happiness with desire to sort of material things. I'm just thinking about the, the, the bohemian who has more time to have sex, to go to parties, you know, and that yeah. so could actually... So, so, so the stipulation of the case is that the artist is like, you know, they, they're miserable, they would be happier as an accountant, but they think, you know, they really choose to live, you know, they, they think my life goes best as, a, as, as an artist because, you know, and that's what I choose. So the point is that it, it makes the case uninteresting if we say, oh look, well the artist is happier and more satisfied and they have their desires met. The point is just to, you know, to say, to, put, to, put, to, put, to say, like, look, we can at least conceptually and theoretically distinguish these kinds of cases. Someone can be uh, uh, miserable, um, or they could be happier in some, in some circumstance, but you know, they wouldn't think that's a good life for them. So I think the example you gave is the example of objectively, in terms of you should change a job because this is going to make you better. Why the hedonism? So the way I understand it, in part, it, I think, I mean, I'm inserting my heart, but I think he says it's what a person thinks makes his life better. No, so that would be, so that theory would just be life satisfactionism, not is hedonism. the definition of hedonistic theories, as in part? No, so hedonism, uh, so hedonism is, is about, uh, what makes your life go well is how happy you are, and it's, it's just a different theory from the idea that what makes your life go well is, uh, is whether you evaluate it to be the case. So this is, this is, I think, like interestingly non-obvious, but hedonism is an objectivist theory of well-being. It says, what makes your life go well is, happiness, is, is how happy you are, even if you think happiness is of no, uh, no value. Like that's you know, th that's the, the setup of the theory. It's only life satisfactionism which gets this subjectivist thing going. I think I'm missing something. <laughs> um, so would subject, subjectivism then accommodate the fact that the, the, the artist is miserable but, but satisfied? Yeah, yeah. So, so the subjectivist says, uh, allow artists to say, your life is going well. The hedonist says, your life is going badly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the reason I think this is, is, this is going to be interesting later is because basically the thing which is going to generate the problems with life satisfactionism is the subjectivism. And lots of people think, you know, um, uh, well-being should be subjectivist. People should choose what makes their life go well. And I'm going to say, I think we basically need to end up being objectivists. And I, think, I don't think that's a cost to the... You know, I think we should be objectivists about well-being rather than subjectivists. Okay. Uh, I had, caught, I had m more disagreement on my taxonomy than I was expecting, but that was useful. Okay, so that's, th that's basically the setup. And now we're going to quickly have a couple of... Uh, quickly have a couple of objections. So uh, I've got... Um, so the first 
just made up the names. I call this the auto maximization or the wire heading objection. So here's how it goes. Um, suppose you want your life to go maximally well. You want to be, be as well off as possible. Uh, on subjectivism, individuals are the authorities of how their lives are going. Therefore, if you decide to judge your life as going maximally well, hey presto, your life is going maximally well. So, um, the, what subjectivism allows, individuals can, can choose what, how their lives go, and so if you want your life to go well, then that's what you should do. Um, so I, I take this, this, um, uh, this, this to be just like a you know, reductio against subjectivism. I just think it's extremely implausible that uh, just the mere fact of me deciding that my life is going in a certain way really does change how well off I am. I don't think just judging my life as excellently really does make, a, does make it the case that my life is going excellently. So I'll go through a few moves, I think, the, the person drawn to life satisfactionism and subjectivism can, uh, can go through. I've got four moves. Um, so I think the first move is the sort of the blank stare, saying what I individuals can just choose for their lives to be going maximally well, and, they, and that's it, like then their lives are. That seems, that seems like that can't be right. That seems like people aren't really playing by the game, that individuals shouldn't be able to cheat in that way. I mean, surely at the least, the th I mean, yeah, people can judge how their lives are going, they are the authorities, but there must be some sort of, some sort of rules in how people can do this. Um, so I think th this is kind of an intuitive uh, f first move, but the response is basically incoherent. So if you're a subjectivist, what you buy is that individuals are the authorities on how their lives go. So then if you say there are, there are rules on how, you know, um, if the idea is I can decide how my life goes, and then you say, look, you can't decide, you, could, you, you have to stick by certain rules in when you make your judgment of how your life is going, then you've just given up on subjectivism. So it's just, uh, it's just motivationally incoherent to say, um, to, to think that they, you can impose any rules on how you judge your life to be going. Um, and the second reply is just, well, um, what exactly would the, oh, I miswritten that. So if there are some rules, well, you know, what exactly would they be? And, and for any, any kind of, it just seems like they don't there doesn't have to be any particular way of formulating it. Um, and for each formulation of, of rules you can have about how I should judge my own life, you know, let's say it's got to be some factor of income and, and my marital prospects and so on. Um, you know, it seems like uh, it just doesn't have to be any, any, particular, any particular set of rules. Um, Okay, I think a, a second tempting move is to say, well, look, so individuals could, in theory, auto-maximise. They could just decide their lives going maximally well, but they won't do this, so it doesn't matter. It's not a problem for the, for the view. So this sort of reply, I think, is, is kind of irrelevant for testing the theory. So what we're doing in these sort of uh, discussions is we're taking some idea and then we're testing it to its logical conclusion, and we're seeing if it really, if it really makes sense. Um, so the fact that people might not, in practice, do it, I don't think is, is so significant. Um, and secondly, if you, if you were drawn to life satisfactionism as a theory of well-being, then this is really what you should be doing. You should just say, well, I'm, my, my life is going really, really well, because then your life is going well. So you've, I think you should be trying to do this for the sake of your own well-being. Um, and I think a, a, kind of a practical implication of this is that when people talk about increasing well-being and they understand well-being as life satisfaction, what we, what we tend to do is think, well, you know, what, are the, what are the determinants of life satisfaction and... Uh, how can we go about increasing people's income and getting them uh, employed and getting them into, into relationships? Because these are the things which make up their, their high levels of life satisfaction. But if, uh, if you're a real, you know, heart of, you know in, in your heart of hearts life satisfaction, you should be thinking, let's just go out and tell people that they can choose for their lives to be going really well. And it is. A serious practical implication would be, you know, this is a, you know, this, if we're looking at cost-effectively improving life satisfaction, we should be getting people to just change how they judge their own lives. Um. <coughs> so, for, for you who are who are classically minded, uh, there's sort of echoes of Plato, Plato's euthyphro dilemma here. So, uh, the, the formulation of that is: Are actions good because the gods love them? Gods love them because they're good. And the equivalent uh, uh, analog here from subjectivism is: Is my life good because I judge it so, or two, do I judge my life as good because it is good? Okay. So, what I think the auto maximization objection indicates is that one is just not really plausible. It seems like um, my life isn't good just because I judge it so. That's not really doing the work. It seems more like, well, I judge my life as going well because 
I think that my life is meeting some sort of standard. There, 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 are, some, there are some things which make up how, how well my life goes, and I think my life's going well according to that standard. So I think two is much more believable. But um, two entails that uh, goodness is not just a matter of my judgments, it just means that it just involves rejecting subjectivism. So subjectivism is the, is what you have, is the kind of, you have to take number one, but number one doesn't seem very plausible. It seems that you know, the reason we do judge our lives well is because there are some things independent um, of how our li uh, of our own judgments which make up how our lives go. Um, so I think if subjectivism is false, then uh, so is what I call the explanatory life satisfactionism, So because it relies on uh, on subjectivism. Um, move three is to uh, is to go on the attack. Um, so what I think the, the the sort of the person attracted to life satisfactionism could do here is to say, okay, this seems like a problem with my theory, but all of the theories have problems, and uh, uh, you know, all of the theories of well-being have have kind of problem cases where it seems like people can cheat in some way, in some theoretical way to get really high well-being. It doesn't really seem like we believe their lives are going well. So I imagine most of you here will be familiar with this, but this is so for the hedonist, the problem is. Um, uh, no six experience machine. So the experience machine, you're offered a chance to plug in effectively to the matrix and super duper scientists have worked this out so that you can have a maximally happy life. You want to be climbing Everest and you will imagine that you are climbing Everest and you'll be getting lots of happiness, but it'll all be fake. Um, and lots of people respond to this by saying, oh, hold on, well, it seems like there's the, the, the person in the experience machine isn't having their life going well. They're happy, but they're not having their life go well. So it seems like there's more to, there's more to well-being than just happiness. It's got to be something else. Maybe it's you know, reality or it's accomplishment or whatever. So um, one thing I've noticed in discussions is that uh, said to me that a reason to be a uh, life satisfactionist, to care about life satisfaction theories of well-being, is because it avoids the experience machine. Um, but in fact, that's just really not true. If you're a life satisfactionist, then you should also be plugging into, this, in, into the experience machine. If what you want is to be as satisfied as possible, well, the, life, the, the experience machine can give you happiness, it can give you life satisfaction, it can give you indeed um, anything else you want apart from reality. Michael, I mean, the example of this, the, re the, the revisionist hedonist who looks back in his life when he thought he was being happy and yeah. having positive experiences, maybe because of drugs or maybe because yeah. he was plugged into the experience machine. Yeah. But ex post realizes that he was part of, he was in an experience machine. Yeah. And now looks back uh, and evaluates his life satisfaction back then as being lower as it may be now being better informed. That doesn't quite fit with it, him. Uh, a license sexness approach being being the same as the experience machine or being vulnerable <coughs> to the experience machine. Yeah, so um, so the, the the sort of the reformed hedonist uh, is supposed to be the case which goes in favour of the life satisfactionist view. Mm -hmm. So you had lots of happiness, but now you've reflected and you thought, well, okay, my life wasn't I wasn't really leading a good life. Um, so uh, if you're kind of if you're sort of comparing these views head to head in terms of their pros and cons, uh, one move you can say if you're drawn to life satisfaction is like oh you know, head, you know the hedonist would be obliged to plug into the experience machine at least it looks something like that. Um, but I just think it's interesting to note that the life satisfactionist would also be obliged to plug into the experience machine at just the same sort of uh, uh, level of concern because the, the experience machine will also generate the. Uh, Know, give you high levels of thinking that you're, that you're judging your life as going well because it can, can provide you with all those things. Um, so for the, uh, so actually I, if we're kind of comparing life satisfactionism to hedonism, I don't think there's, I don't think the life satisfactionist can say, oh look, your view has you know, some really strange implications, hedonist, um, because I think you know, the, the life satisfactionism has the same concern. Um, the, the life satisfactionist is a bit is a, on slightly stronger ground looking at desire theories. So one example is um, John Rawls's grass counter. So uh, there's, imagine there's some some Harvard professor, and all they desire is to uh, sit on the on Harvard lawn with their with their uh, magnifying glass, counting blades of grass. Um, so it seems like they're getting what they want. So it seems like their well-being must be really high. But many people will think, well, you know, intuitively their life isn't really going well. Um, even if their desires are being met. So uh, I think the life satisfactionist is, is, a, is on a bit stronger ground comparing to des desire views, um, but uh, 
know, there's also problems. But I think you know, there might be some ways the desire satisfactionists you know, ch change their theory to avoid these kinds of cases, but I'm, uh, I'm not going to explore those here. Um, and the fourth move in response to auto-maximization is for the life satisfaction theorist to bite the bullet and say, well, yeah, I guess, I guess if people do judge their lives to go well, then their lives just really are going well. And that's, you know, that's, uh, that's we, we learned something new today. We didn't think that would be the case, and we've learned a, a new surprising implication of our theory. And that doesn't seem to me to be very satis satisfactory. The second objection of two uh, is what I call the too few judges objection. So on life satisfactionism, well-being, and judgments of how your life is going, fine. Um, but what do we say about entities which cannot or do not make these judgments? So there's going to be non-human animals, maybe humans with cognitive disabilities. So judging how your life is going overall against some standard, it's quite, you've got to have some like quite heavy cognitive machinery to do that. You've got to be able to look at all these different bits of your life and you've got to have some standard or standards with which to weigh them in some way of comparing yourself. Like that's quite complicated. So you can imagine that, say, dogs just don't have this kind of machinery. They might be able to feel pleasure and pain. They probably have desires. They can have beliefs about the world. But it seems like, it seems like quite a stretch to say that uh, you know, Fido here can really judge how uh, his life is going overall. And so the implication of that uh, on life satisfactionism is that Fido uh, is just not a subject of, of welfare. Uh, Fido has no level of well-being. It just doesn't count because it can't make these sort of judgments. So what that follows is that if you were to take Fido and you know, set him on fire, that would make Fido's life go no better and no worse because Fido just can't make the kind of judgments which are required for, um, uh, for life to, uh, to, to have any sort of well-being at all. Um, so by contrast, I don't think it's so controversial to claim unconscious objects, things like you know, rocks, really can't have levels of welfare. But it seems just not very intuitive to think that sentient entities which can't make these judgments don't count at all. So things like, you know, uh, humans with cognitive disability. It seems more like the right thing is, is sentience, whether you, can, whether you can feel more so, or at least uh, that's, that's one explanation, more so rather than whether you can make these judgments. That's quite, that's quite a high bar for what we care about. I think that puts the bar in the wrong place. Um, Michael, thank you. I mean, I personally have never thought about um, the fact that life satisfaction is that surveys are obviously limited to human beings capable of responding. Yeah. Um, and so that's a good argument. Um, but when I saw too few judges objection, um, 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 allow me to give a small tangent, but one of the, the, the interesting aspects of life satisfaction and other surveys is that you can have other people um, validate, externally validate, for example, the scores that somebody self-reports. So one classic test is um, having, say, if um, um, the surveyor asks you about your life satisfaction, and that's what we need to optimize. But it can be externally validated by asking me, who works with you, see, look, how satisfied do you think Mike lives with his life to try and get some kind of, uh, as an extra judge, essentially, get a sense for whether there's validity to what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, so, so I think what, what we could do is we could, I could say, how satisfied do I think Fido is with his life? And then you could respond, like, well, I don't think, you know, I don't think you make those kind of judgments, actually. So I guess... We, do we give him a naught, a ten? No, actually, we just don't give Fido a score, a score at all. And that's why you could set him on fire, and it wouldn't be good or bad for Fido's well-being, because Fido doesn't count as having well-being. Yeah, so so the practical limitation of well-being, animal welfare brings all that into Yeah, yeah, and, and it seems like we want our theories of ethics to be able to cope with these sort of edge cases, not just the conventional, uh, you know, present-day humans one. Um, yeah, so uh, I hope you'll allow me to go over for a couple of minutes. I'm close to the end. Um, I think there's a couple of moves the life satisfactionist could make here to try and uh, defend against this problem. So one, rather than saying you have to judge the whole of your life, maybe you can just sort of judge bits of it in some way. Um, but it's a bit odd to think that, you know, if you think that dogs can't judge their lives overall, it's still odd to think they can judge, you know, how satisfied they are with the walks their owner has given them and, and these sorts of things. So I think that's sort of sticky ground. Um, you could think that well-being... Um, doesn't isn't 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 these judgments of life, but other sort of what are called in philosophy pro attitudes, things like liking, preferring, desiring. Um, but the problem with this move is it just abandons subjectivism. It's going to say, look, what makes the dog's life go well is that the dog likes going for walks with with you know, his owner, rather than uh, that they can uh, that the dog can make such a judgment. Um, and the third move is again to bite the bullet, and I just don't 
don't find it very satisfactory that our theory of well-being is just going to cast out um, all of these entities which are you know, not fully functioning humans. Um, okay, so, uh, so that's my conclusion. I think life satisfactionism seems pretty implausible as a theory of well-being, um, and this is because it relies on subjectivism, um, and the subjectivism which is the thing which you know, really generated the two problems. Um, it just doesn't, doesn't seem very plausible that I can just will myself into having maximum well-being, or that sentient uh, entities who can't make these complicated judgments just don't count at all. Um, and I think the, the implication of this is that we should be tempted to abandon subjectivism and so life satisfactionism as well. Now, also, I haven't given you the, you know, the comparative uh, twos and, twos and uh, fours of the uh, different views, um, but that's why I think the argument at least pushes us. Uh, it doesn't follow, importantly, that we should give up on measuring life satisfaction. I think it just follows that we should, be, you know, we should, have less, we should put less weight on the idea that life satisfaction is really the ideal measure of well-being. Okay, so where I think this sort of takes us is that, okay, if it's the subjectivism which has the problem, cut out life satisfaction, and then our theories of well-being are, you know, all our theories, all our kind of remaining, the remaining contenders are the objectivist ones, um, which I think is a pretty interesting result. Um, and then the, the epilogue, so when I, I, when I, on, I think on Monday, I spoke to Jan about this talk, and, he, and, he, and I said, well, I'm just going to attack life satisfaction theories of well-being, and that's it. He said, what, but aren't you going to say something a bit more useful? Aren't you going to really like, tell us what should happen next? So um, I haven't argued for this, uh, except indirectly, but I think hedonism is a pretty plausible theory of well-being. I think many people who are drawn to subjective well-being uh, tend to think it's sort of like a two-horse race. There's you know, happiness and there's life satisfaction, and both of these maybe matter, but uh, you know, if one doesn't matter, then probably the other one does. So... I'm tempted to think that, uh, that the ideal measure of well-being is going to be happiness rather than life satisfaction. Okay, what does that look like in practice? So I think probably the experience sampling method where you ask people, how do you feel right now, good to bad, is probably the most accurate way to find out how people feel. It's not subject to concerns about memory bias. Um, so I think that's going to be, you know, that's kind of the theoretically, if we could have lots of money and we could get lots of people to do it, I think that's going to be uh, about the best we could do. Um, but I don't claim that that's, in practice, the best way of collecting happiness data because you know, there's lots of costs associated. So I'm sort of I'm th you know, throwing it up to you, the social scientists in the room, to help, help me work out well, if, if that's maybe the best one, what's, is, there a, is there a better thing we can do? And, you know, and how, uh, you know, how, how, how good does the day reconstruction method look? Experience and, what, and what sort of different results does it give us? So imagine it's going to be some trade-off of accuracy where we're using uh, experience sampling method as the gold standard and then concerns about you know, cost and feasibility. So I talk. So, sorry, I, so isn't the idea of happiness more ephemeral? Uh, uh, I, I think about happiness sort of changing, right? Changing, uh, whereas life satisfaction, if you think sort of like a more long-term thing rather than sort of the lived experience, I can be happy in the morning, I can be miserable at night. Uh, and it can keep changing over the days, and then in a week, I can, my life satisfaction hasn't changed much in general. Yeah, so, so what the hedonist is going to say is that um, if I want to know how well your life is going, I just need to add up all of those individual moments. If I can kind of plot them under a graph, you know, your happiness is just the area under the, under the line, and like, you know, so that's what all of the individual's moments matter, and your life is just the, the sum total of, of how good all of those moments mm -hmm. are. Even if it fluctuates more and more cyclicality or seasonality in the way you respond. To yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I care about, you know, the headness is going to care about all of your experiences and not just some of your experiences. This is more difficult to measure because what, what you need is all that It's still of. part of what makes you, uh, like, uh, defines somehow your degree of happiness, no? Uh, yeah, so, so the question we're, we're interested in is, like, you know, I in the end, what's the thing which really matters? Mm -hmm. And... Um, a happy life is probably one where you're satisfied with your life and your desires are met and you have things like friendship and, uh, and knowledge. So you know, in practice, the theories of well-being are going to overlap. But the question that, that, you know, that's, that's at hand is, well, if we have to choose, and we do have to choose, which one do we should we ultimately find most plausible? Mm -hmm. So you know, obviously, how happy you are will, will be in part determined by how satisfied you are with your life. How satisfied you are with your life will in part be determined by how happy you are. Really care about. Yeah. 
Can I go first? Can I know that we've got a um, big, big point up is burning in my, up in my tongue. Um, I think there's something you've missed. And it sits between, um, it's where there's an objective aspect and a subjectiveness. And, and where we could potentially even go to measuring animal welfare directly uh, without needing people or dogs to fill out surveys. Which is there's fMRI studies that are coming up uh, that you may, may, may be familiar with or not, but you haven't mentioned it. Is where um, it'd be very expensive to do this on an experience sampling method or day reference like throughout the day constantly. But maybe in the future, where imagine where you're being essentially being tracked without any necessary survey, you're being tracked uh, looking where there's activity in the brain. We know, we now know, thanks to neuroscience, that the pre left prefrontal cortex uh, complex is meant to um, um, show activity for experiencing pleasure, and the opposite side of the, the, the uh, our brains where we're experiencing negative. Um, there's some studies showing that the survey reports coming back from life satisfaction or well-being match up quite nicely with where we're, we're seeing that in brain. So is this uh, hopefully, maybe a fatal flaw in your argumentation that subjectivism is an issue, and then we can. So I, th I think that's. That we um, can not maybe in the future objectify. So I think that's. Uh, so su subjectivism is, uh, I'm using that word in, a, in like a, quite a particular way for the purpose of the conversation. So the subjectivist view is you know, well being is about what, you know, how your life goes is about how you judge it, what well being is. So I, I take your point to be a suggestion about um, how we can use um, objective measures um, to help, to help, uh, yeah, so I think, so what, what I think is maybe promising for the future is you have your ESM data, people know how they feel, you've got like a little fMRI hat, and then you're, you're, you're using your um, subjective reports of how happy people are as your, your, your sort of ground truth with which to work out which are the relevant uh, uh, neural objective measures, and then people are walking around in their days, and then they've got their fMRI hats on, you go, oh, okay, I think you're happy, um, and that's because I've trained it on you know, your self-reports. So it's still relying on the self-reports to give us you know, the, the ground truth to do the training, but that would be, you know, maybe that's the better way of, of collecting data on happiness than having to like, you know, people having to up, uh, press a button on, on, a, on an app. So a helpful suggestion as to how we might in practice collect um, experience data without having to press the whole time. to the um, automatic maximization um, object and one reply to the uh, few judges object. So the, so the best theory of, of life satisfaction that I know is the, is the Sumner book, essentially. And there he makes it the important caveat that there's a, a sort of a truth constraint uh, in, in the judgments. And so it seems that the general thought there is that it is not the judgment of the individual as that individual is like, but some idealized version of that, of that individual. And so you might restate the subjectivist position as a, the, the, the subjectivist judgment or the, the subjective judgment of an idealized observer that isn't interested in maximizing well-being, but that is instead trying to be truthful. And it seems that, that this idealized version would avoid the automatic maximization objection. So it seems like you, you would need to answer some ways about why idealizing the observer is, isn't helpful. So that's the first one. The second one is that there might be some non-substantive constraints on judgments. So, so just formal constraints on, on judging. So you might think that, there are, um, that there's uh, constraints in the sense of having coherent beliefs, uh, of, of having um, sort of some transitivity constraints about which which uh, worlds are are ordered in some way, and so there might be these formal constraints that we just um, demand from a person judging things, mm -hmm. but that aren't substantive, mm -hmm. that are purely formal. Mm -hmm. And then just quickly, the few, can, I, can, I, can I can I can I respond to that before? Sure. Um, so I think neither of those are, uh, are going. Um, going to get away from the, the challenge of the, of the objection. Uh, so uh, Sumner has, uh, thinks that people's views have to be sort of authentic and informed. So um, the, the issue with that is that you could, let's say that your views are informed, um, but you can just still decide that you want to, you can just be in, informed, but still decide that you want to have um, maximum well-being. And so 
the, the challenge with, comp with imposing constraints on how you can make your sort of the substantive constraints on what sort of judgments you can make is that it's just inconsistent with subjectivism. Even if they're purely formal and not substantive. Uh, so I think, the, I think the formal thing is, you know, that's just like, you know, your judgments have to follow uh, the bounds of logic. I think yeah. that's, that's sort, of, it's sort of in the weeds because, let's move to the second point, because you can just abide by you know, sort of logical constraints and still uh, have uh, and still ha face the objection. So I could just say, look, I think my life is going maximally well if two is a prime number. And it's totally unrelated to my life. There's no, there's no danger of logical okay. consistency. And, uh, and that's it. So uh, if, so if someone says, well, look, but that's not really what you value, I can say, well, look, you told me subjectivism is true. I can value what I damn well like. And I value two being a prime number. And that's why my life is going maximally well. And just quickly on the two few judges. Um, so you might think that um, that life satisfaction has a limited domain, namely only for, for those sorts of entities that can do the judging. Yeah. But that life satisfaction just lexically dominates uh, other sorts of, of, of values. Yeah, nice. Um, where, uh, but it only dominates in cases where life satisfaction uh, applies. And so that would get you out of the objection, but wouldn't be elegant anymore. Um, yeah, so it won't get you out of the practical force of the objection. So what, what is a hybrid account of well-being where you say, look, uh, happiness and so does life satisfaction. So there are, there are two things which make up well-being. So we can just leave aside that there's just going to be some real challenges in motivating such accounts because they're going to have inconsistent explanatory theses about why, you know, why they each matter. But um, okay, so let's. I take your suggestion as you as you put it. So um, uh, I have uh, no life satisfaction part of well-being. I have a part of uh, me which is my well-being, which is life satisfaction. So it would increase my life satisfaction by any amount to torture Fido and to set him on fire. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, in the cases where life satisfactionism applies, namely entities that can judge. Their happiness does not matter. But as soon as no judgments can be made, happiness starts to matter. So life satisfaction dominates lexically in cases where judgments are possible. OK, that's an interesting suggestion. So um, that's going to say, when we're judging Fido's well-being, we judge them in terms of ha So it's like happiness for, for, non for, for animals, and yeah. then happiness and life satisfaction for humans. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I think then a, then a real challenge is just how you're going to make these, how you're going to do any of your trade-offs. So what's the... That's why I say lexically. Yeah, so if it's lexically, so uh, if any amount of life satisfaction is worth, if some amount of what life satisfaction is worth any amount of, um, of happiness, okay, so I get some amount of extra life satisfaction um, from torturing Fido. Let's say it gives me no happiness, it just makes me more satisfied. Right. So Fido uh, only has happiness, but that's trumped in your view. So a lexical view is just one where you have any amount of something but is... that's not special to life satisfactionism. So that's, that's, that's just a general problem of, of interpersonal and, or in that case, interspecies aggregation. But that seems to be a problem for any theory. Uh, well, so it, it's a... I don't think it's really a problem of, uh, of aggregation um, because we can just... Because we know how we're adding up the units here. And the way we're adding up the units is that we only count Fido's happiness. We count my happiness but we count my life satisfaction as well. And if it's lexical, then, then life satisfaction trumps. But you can have it within person or within entity lexical. Um, right. Um, so this is going to be really, really vulnerable to spectrum cases. OK, so imagine, uh, so, um, so imagine we're looking at uh, me as a human, OK, and then so at some point, humans were amoebas. Okay, so you just go backwards in time. So there's going to be some human for whom it's true that they have their life satisfaction counts and their happiness counts. And for that person's parents, uh, only their happiness counts. And th the issue with spectrum cases is just they feel grossly unintuitive that you're going to have. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So. so with your um, approach, I guess you're interested in, a, in an ideal overall a uh, perfect kind of approach that would, in your view, result in a happy society. And I, I if I try to be philosophical, I'll label my critique of your uh, approach, pre 
pragmatism and say that uh, I guess life satisfaction is in, a, in some sense a pragmatic uh, approach because it's somehow predictive of how people uh, behave and that is a value right now and maybe you provided an argument against that but uh, I'm, I'm uh, just remembering this uh, example that uh, I was given of people having kids even though you could say it's, it's no sex machine negative and I was just wondering whether there's you know, uh, anything that that example would, would maybe do to enrich your argument. And then also, I mean, in the interest of time, you went through those other reasons, the six yeah. quite fast. Yeah. Um, and that's cool. But I guess in the future, you have to be more uh, elaborate on, on how exactly they don't work. Because I, I wasn't able to follow exactly for each of them. Yeah, I mean, the, the flavor of that one was that there are a bunch of different reasons, but none of them uniquely pick out life satisfaction right. is what matters. So let's say you want your measure to be clear. Okay, like fine, that seems like a criteria. But you know, we could clearly measure plenty of things like height. Yeah. Um, so, so clarity doesn't get you to, yeah. In, in that sense, I guess pragmatism is a good umbrella term because you'd want a measure that is still overall in combination, even though each of these reasons on their own is insufficient good in combining all of them as... Yeah, so, so I don't take that to be the task at hand. The task at hand is, exactly. the, 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 the task at hand is to work out as a matter of, you know, so we need to, so, okay, let's be pragmatic. Uh, pr uh, pragmatic. Okay, so let's pragmatically do, do the stuff which is useful. Okay, but how do we, okay, we want to usefully increase well-being, but how do we know what's usefully going to increase well-being? You can only answer that question if you've settled your theoretical questions about, you know, what really do we think well-being is, and that's the question that I'm, uh, you know, that I'm taking on. I can give a longer answer to this, but I think we're out of... Yeah, we're out, but I think maybe one last question. So, very quickly, because in the end, you seem to endorse hedonism, but you raised uh, uh, a critique to hedonism, to life satisfactionism, which applies to hedonism, which is a non sex machine. Yeah. And if I can give a defense to it, uh, it's, so the, the way it's framed as a machine is, okay, would you actually plug yourself into a machine? Which, into a one to one. And a counter-argument, which doesn't come from me, comes from Green, not a philosopher. He says, okay, let's make the example now we, we are just unplugged. We wake up and we are paralyzed in a horrible world and we are asked, okay, do you want to be plugged again and forget? In this case, I'm pretty sure 99% of the people would say yes. Yeah, so that's. So, this, so I, I agree. This is an argument in favor of hedonism. Yeah, I agree with you, but, that, but this, is, that's, this is helpful to my overall project and a challenge to anything I've, I've said here. So I think that, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a defense of hedonism that in the end you, because you, you raise this concept, but you don't really address it. Yeah, no, I didn't, I, I didn't try to, so the, you know, the classic ob objection to hedonism is the experience machine. And the reason I didn't try and defend it here, plus it takes a through the, the intuitions and discuss it, but, but in the terms of the dialectic, if you imagine the hedonist and the life satisfactionist fighting each other, if the life satisfactionist and says, oh, like you've got the experience machine, uh, you know, that's, that's your view has that weird implication. The hedonist can turn around and say, you says you should plug into the experience machine as well. So that's why I didn't get into it because appealing to the experience machine doesn't help the life satisfactionist basically. But no, I, I, I don't think the experience machine is too bad and uh, maybe I'll, you know, and in a future talk, I'll, I'll explain why I don't think it's so bad. But that wasn't today's project. Thank you, Michael.